So we've been in this series on the life of David. Uh, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to do a little bit of reading here. 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting with verse 1. If you have your phones or your Bibles, pull them out. If you watch, you can read the screen. It says, Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Socha in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes, Domin. They, uh, uh, between Soka and Azekah, Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah, which is a really beautiful valley there in Israel, and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another, with the valley between them, a champion named Goliath, a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits of span, which... You know, depending on translations and what scholars have said, uh, he's over nine feet. Some have said he's like, you know, seven, six, like Yao Ming or something like that. But um, we're going to go with the over nine feet. It just sounds more intimidating. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels, which is 15 pounds. I don't think it's that heavy, but you know, it's in the Bible. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified want to speak to you today from the title, and they all fall down. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity for us to just delve into your word, to read your text messages. Thank you for this space where we can hear from you. Father, open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts that we might see you, that we might hear you, that we may know you better. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen and amen. In ancient Palestine, along the eastern border, were a mountain range, still there to this day. It's where all the ancient cities in the Bible, popular ones like Bethlehem and Jerusalem, were. Now, along the Mediterranean there was a coastal plain, and this is where the Philistines lived. Uh, They were a seafaring group of people from Crete, and uh, they had made their home there Uh, on the coastal plain where modern Tel Aviv is today. And connecting these mountains, Jerusalem and Bethlehem and all these other ancient uh, cities, uh, and connecting them with this coastal plain was a series of valleys and ridges. And uh, and it was called the Shephelah. In fact, those of you who've had the opportunity to travel out there have probably seen these valleys. They're just, again, some of the most beautiful places in Israel. And for armies that wanted to invade, hostile armies that wanted to invade, they would go through the Shephelah to get to the higher mountains where they could attack and have an advantage. And so Saul got word that the Philistines were on their way, and they decided to meet them in this passageway. They decided to meet them at the Valley of Elah. And the problem is, is that once they got to the valley, the, the Philistines on the southern end and the Israelites on the northern end, no one wanted to attack because if they went into the valley, they would have the disadvantage, right? And they didn't want that. So they basically were just staring at each other for a really long time like, you know, you know how it is when you try to act like you're about to fight somebody, you don't want to fight anybody. Like, you, I wish you would, I wish you would. And so finally the Philistines said, this is, this is, this is crazy. Let's just, let's, Let's not, let's not uh, 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 enter into a war with so much bloodshed. Just send out one of your champions, and we'll send out one of our champions. And this is where the story begins. And Goliath, for like 40 days, is just talking trash. 
right? He's like the biggest trash talker. He's like Draymond Green right now, just talking all kinds of mess at, at, the, at the Israelites and, and talking about their God and their mama and their daddies and everything like that for 40 days. And Saul and his army, they are just so afraid. Nobody wants to fight the champion from Gath. Now, how did Goliath earn that title champion? Well, obviously, he's done this before, right? There's been a number of pay-per-view events where he has clearly been the victor. The many battles that have been won with his spear and with his shield and with his might. And so this is going on for 40 days. Now, just a ways away, there's another story that's going on, right? Unbeknownst to David and his father Jesse, because they didn't have social media, and there was no way to know what was happening in the battlefield, David, who is our, 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 our character for this series, his father says, I want to check on my boys. He has three oldest boys are in Saul's army. He says, I want to check on my boys. So listen, son, David, I want you to go to the battlefield Give me good word. Let, tell, me, tell me if they're okay, if they're alive, if they're injured, if they're hungry. I know they missed some of my cooking. So he fixes him some bread and some cheese, I guess a grilled cheese sandwich. It's not in the text. I just imagine it's there. And so he sets David up. David agrees to do this. Now, what we learned last week is that by this time, David is pulling double duty. He is working for Saul as his armor bearer and his court musician. Remember, uh, Saul had a problem. He had a, not, a, not a, 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 a rodent infestation. He had like a demon infestation. The Bible says that an evil spirit had come upon him. And every time an evil spirit came upon him, he would have to lean on David's musicianship and his spirit because the spirit of God, according to the text, had left Saul because of his disobedience and his refusal to submit to God, and the spirit of God was now upon David. So Saul just, uh, Saul just wanted to be around David. He wanted him around for his, 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 his warrior stature, because the Bible tells us that David was a great warrior, and because spirit of God and his musicianship. So David is going back and forth, the Bible tells us, from Saul's courts, working for him, you know, nine to five, and then he would go back to his, his father, Jesse, and work as a shepherd. And we talked about that last week, right? How can you be anointed as the king, the anointed as the future king, and then go back to working it in and out, right? We talked about that last week. But this is what David's life was. He knows he's going to be the future king of Israel, yet he's working for the current king of Israel, Talk about awkward, right? And, and also while doing that, he's flipping burgers, right? He's, he's still working as a sheep herder. And this is where we find the story. And so uh, 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 you know, Jesse says, can you, can you just check on my, 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 my sons, your brothers? So the Bible says that David agrees to do so. Early in the morning, the Bible says in verse 20, we're still in chapter 17. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up, a set, and, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry, which I always think is funny. I don't know why they're shouting a war cry. They ain't about to go to war. <laughs> Again, just talking mess, just talking trash. Right? I wish you would, right? The Bible says that uh, as they're shouting their war cry, Israel and the Philistines were, were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were. Before I go any further, I just want to say something. This is almost, and it almost goes by without notice, but I just, want, I just want to just point this out. I just love the fact that the details in Scripture. The Bible says that he got up how early? <laughs> early in the morning, right? He didn't just leave at noon. He didn't just crawl out of bed after oversleeping. The Bible says he got up early in the morning to do what his father had asked him to do. Isn't it interesting that had he not gotten up when he did and left when he did, he would have never seen Goliath? He would have never been there at this moment? There's a lot of small things that we do that amount to some big opportunities. You know that? A lot of small things, ordinary things that we do, that if we do them well, will add up to big opportunities. Never look at stuff as simple as getting out of bed on time, getting out of the house on time, being punctual, making your bed. 
Come on now. Simple things, right? Simple things. Knowing how to wash dishes and sweep and mop floors, not being afraid of some manual labor. The little things that we do, learning how to be respectful, engaging people, giving them eye contact, smiling when you talk to them, standing up straight. It's the little details, and David seems to be a master at these small little details that lead to big opportunities. Things that we would have thought would have been insignificant, the fact that he's a musician and he knows how to play the harp. Who would have ever thought that would have given him access to the king's courts, right? You never know the time that you put into even your musicianship, what opportunities it will open up for you down the road. That is why we do everything with excellence. We do everything we can at our best because you never know what opportunities are going to be open to you. Amen? I'm telling you, before you can be extraordinary, you have to do a lot of extraordinary things. I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but it's real, right? Before you can become extraordinary, you have to do a lot of extraordinary stuff. Now, people don't always say this in a positive light, but I'm going to tell you today. This is for the young people. Uh, older folks, you can just turn your ears off here. It's okay to be extra, all right? It's okay to be extra. It's okay to be extra because a lot of times when we, when we, when we take the extra time and we, and, we, and we look at the details extra and, and, we, and we, we decide to give an extra effort, we decide to go the second mile, as Jesus says, it opens up big opportunities. And this is exactly what happens with David. He's extra. <laughs> He's extra, and it's going to lead to him being extraordinary. So he's now looking, he's, he's now listening. Let's finish up that text now. We keep the text up there. As uh, uh, he asked how his brothers were doing, as he was talking with them, Goliath the Philistine, champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and I love this part right here, and David heard it. David heard it. So he's talking with his, you know, his, his fam, like, what's going on? How you doing? Eliab, man, man, I miss playing Uno with you, man. Yeah, I mean, listen, I'm just glad you're alive because dad was concerned, but I knew my big bro was going to be all right. And as he's talking to his bros, he hears Goliath talking mess. What do you think happens? Well, you know the text. David starts saying, how long has this uncircumcised Philistine been talking all this mess? Right? Oh, no, it ain't, ain't that long, David. You know, not that long. Just like, you know, a few days. You know, 40 days. For, for 40 days? He's been talking about your mama for 40 days? He's been talking about your God for 40 days. Well, you know, I mean, he really don't even know my mama, so I wasn't even that offended. Wait, 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 wait. What in the world is going on? Okay, okay, okay. Listen, okay. Has the king offered anything? I mean, just to, to be a motivation for you? What is the king offering? Well, they said we could, you know, be with his, his daughter. She, she beautiful, you know? She's great. And that we wouldn't have to pay taxes. We'd be given more wealth. I mean, and that's not even a motivating factor for you. Nah, bro, have you, seen, have you seen Goliath? Have you seen the champ? Verse 28. When Eliab, Dave's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? Why is he throwing shade at his little bro? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Uh, wow. Eliab. First of all, he brought you a grilled cheese sandwich from your dad. Say thank you. No, 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 no. He calls his little bro out. I know why you're here. It wasn't to check on us. It wasn't to give us any food. You're here because you're arrogant, David. You're full of conceit. I know your heart. It's wicked. All you want to do is see a little action. Question. Is he right? I mean, how do you know? It's not like any of you really know David. <laughs> he could actually be right. You know, our, our family does know us pretty well. If I talk to your brother right now and ask him about you, he'd probably tell me some stuff you don't want me to know. 
If I talked to your sister about you, how you were as a big sister, you know, she would tell me some stuff about you. You know, our family does know a lot about us. But can I say this as well? They don't know everything about us. Sometimes even family get it wrong. Sometimes the family that lives with us doesn't even understand who we are, right? And what may look like conceit to Eliab really was just confidence. And conceitedness and confidence are two different things. And, and in fact, you know, there's a thin line between manipulation and influence, right? There's a thin line between love and infa infatuation or, or limerence. It, it really depends on your character. I had one time somebody came up to me and said, Pastor, you're a manipulator. I said, what? They said, yeah. I said, why would, you, why would you call me a manipulator? Because I have seen people go into a meeting with you, and they were certain they wanted to go this direction, but after talking to you, they changed their mind. And I was like, well, I would just call that leadership, but all right. Right? But there's a thin line. If you don't trust my character, then it is manipulation. Maybe I am doing something just for my own personal delight. Maybe I am just focused on myself. Or I may see a bigger picture and doing what is best, I believe, for the church. It all depends on the character. So on the outside, yes, it may look like conceit. It may look like arrogance. But Eliab does not know David's heart. And so what sounds like judgment right now was really meant to discourage David. But I am so glad, I am so glad that there are many out here today that did not allow the discouragement of their siblings and their parents get in the way of them accomplishing what God had destined for you to do. Amen? I, listen, I, I unfortunately was on the wrong end of this. My younger brother, who is, I'm not even just saying this because he's my, he's my baby bro, I say this because this is, this is true. He is the best public defender in Riverside County. He is amazing at what he does. He has a reputation that people who are incarcerated and know they want the best defender are begging for him to defend them. The word has gotten out. But you know what? My brother, after the third time of failing to pass the bar, I gave him an encouraging word. I said, Greg, maybe this isn't your path, man. <laughs> you, said you, you said you liked teaching, maybe just being a history teacher. That's, that's what you should do. And, I, and, and here, I just didn't want to see my brother disappointed anymore. And clearly, he's not passing the bar, so I mean, bro, like, like LeBron, stop shooting threes, right? Right? Just stop. What I didn't know is at this time, my brother, he later found this out, he was diagnosed with depression and ADHD. It was a very difficult time in his life. It had a hard time focusing. But I am so glad my brother did not listen to my counsel because he took it a fourth time and he passed. And because my brother did not give up on what he knew was his dream and his purpose, he has saved lives. Let me tell you something. Some of y'all don't really understand our judicial system, but it is broken on so many levels. And there are people that go away for two and three years before they even have a trial, just because somebody accused them of something that had, had yet to be proven especially during COVID, there were, there were fathers that were in prison that missed out three, four years of their child's life. My brother has to defend these people and save them. And I think to myself, Jesus, if you're any, if you're, if you're as good as my brother Greg at defending, I'll thank you so much. Because Jesus is our public defender, amen? And he defends us against our accuser, and so I'm so glad my brother didn't listen to me, and I'm going to tell you right now, you don't listen. If people don't see your heart, do not understand your character, do not embrace your dreams, it is still your responsibility to do so for yourself. You have to have enough faith in yourself. You have to have enough trust in what God has placed in your heart. I love encouragement. I wish, 
Listen, my family frowned when they heard I was going into ministry. They were like, you know there's no money in that, right? But you have to have enough faith, enough trust in your own dream. Even if your parents don't believe in it, even if your siblings don't believe in it, you have to have enough faith because at the end of the day, it is your responsibility to fulfill it. Amen? All right, let's continue on here. Verse 32, we're in 1 Samuel, verse 32. They had gotten word that David was inquisitive, asking a lot of questions about what was going on, and so they brought him before Saul. Now, this is a, kind of an interesting story because Saul already knows who David is, but it almost sounds like he doesn't know him in this chapter. But it's clear that in, 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 the, in, the, in the verses that he had been employed at this time by Saul. So this is a little bit of a disconnect, but again, I'm not the author of this text, right? Let's just keep reading here. So David says to Saul in verse 32, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Now what you need to understand before we go on any further, before this point, David is already known as a good warrior. We read that in chapter 16. He's already known as a good warrior. So this is not like some rando just showing up and saying, yeah, man, you may have seen me at the drive-thru, you know, at In-N-Out. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty mean with the rocks, you know? Like this is, this is not some just, again, random person. He's a warrior and Saul's armor bearer. And you need to understand this. Anytime a king would select an armor bearer, he chose somebody that he knew could have his back if things went south, right? You don't want someone that could just hold your shield. You want somebody who knows his way around a battlefield. So Saul had already chosen David to be his armor bearer. And, and, and might I add, might I add at this point, Jonathan himself in chapter 14 is a pretty good fighter himself. There's a great story about Jonathan and his armor bearer like taking on an outpost, a Philistine outpost, where they were back to back and they took out 20 Philistines all by themselves, like Bruce Lee style, right? And even Jonathan looking at, at Goliath was like, yeah, no, I'm good. He can keep talking about my mama, I'm good, right? So, so, so there's a lot of fear in the ranks, even among the best of warriors. So David goes before Saul as a warrior. I'll fight him. <laughs> but of course, Saul was like, bro, listen, I mean, this man has been fighting since his youth. This is what Saul says. He's been fighting since his youth. You still a youth, <laughs> okay? He's been doing this since he was your age, and he's now surpassed that. So not only does he have the tactical advantage of being bigger than you, having better equipment than you, but he's been doing this for longer, okay? He's the champion from Gath. You're out of your league. I'm going to say something to you. Before David even gets into the ring with Goliath, he has been having to fight his own people. Isn't that amazing? Before he even gets into the ring with Goliath to fight what everyone knows is the real enemy, he has to fight with his brother, he has to fight with his king, he has to fight with perception, all of this stuff. And can I just say something really quick here? Family, we will never accomplish what we need to accomplish for the kingdom of God if all we are fighting is one another. Do you know how many hours, how, many how much time is wasted just with infighting? It's interesting, you read this entire chapter, it's about David and Goliath, but very little is spent on the actual battle between David and Goliath. It's just a few verses. The rest of it is all of this, yo, I can do it. No, you can't. <laughs> Why are you even here? Who's watching the sheep? Go back, sheep herder. <laughs> right? All of this is going on in the background. And I'm telling you right now, if a church spends most of its time and energy fighting amongst themselves, doubting one another, not trusting motives, oh, I know what your heart is. Your heart is evil. Your heart is wicked. I know you, th you think you can make the decisions because you have more money than me. You think you can make the decisions because you've been here longer than me. You think you can make the decisions because you have more degrees than me. All of this infighting. Aren't we on the same team? Right? Right? 
What we need to do is simply say this, how can we help? Clearly you have resources in this area and you have resources in this area and you have experience in this area. How can we work together as a team to accomplish the will of God in the city of Glendale, right? Before we even get to Goliath, we knocking each other out, throwing rocks. So, so Saul's trying to give him all these excuses, but David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping, this is verse 34, verse 34, but David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. This is kind of funny because I, I wouldn't even use this as a lead out. I mean, I would, I would try to like find maybe one of these stories on the battlefield. No, no, no. Your servant has been sheep herding. So I've been keeping my father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, this is going to be hard to read. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, this uncircumcised. I don't know why he's just stuck on this uncircumcision part here. I mean, it's a choice. Let people choose what they want, right? But clearly what David is trying to say is this uncircumcised is not a part of the covenant. He doesn't serve the God that we serve. We know we are destined to be successful. God has made a promise. He said it to our great, great, great granddaddy Abraham. Father Abraham, the one we sing the songs about. I know this man has never sung that song before. I'm telling you, God is on our side. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, I go and the Lord will be with you. I knocked something over here. Oh, man, there's a little water in it. I'm so sorry if that was somebody's. It's like a little orange. You'll be good. The five-minute rule. <laughs> Now, now, now yeah, let, me just, let me just pause here. Can I just say something about David? Can I say something about David? I mean this with all respect. I, I, I would say this to his face, and I, and I will on the new earth. All right? David's a little, he's a little different, right? I mean, if a lion took one of the sheep and started walking off with it, I'm like, that's the will of God. That's just, the, you know, <laughs> the responsible thing would just to be to stay with the sheep that remained and didn't just wander off, right? I mean, shame on you, little lost sheep. He's talking about bears and lions walking off with the sheep already in their mouth. To me, that's just game. That's game. That's game. Game time, right? He goes after them. And he says, he says that when basically the other weapons weren't working, I would grab them by their hair. David's crazy. But David's a different cat, is he not? I mean, this guy, he plays, listen, he plays the harp. He's a shepherd. He's also a warrior. He's a poet. David's just different. But you know what? God likes different. <laughs> and God can use different. <laughs> I know sometimes you don't feel like you, you really fit the mold. You, 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 you're, you're not in that lane, but that's okay. God can use different. I just, and here's, watch this, and God creates different. All you have to do is just walk around in nature and say, God, you must be different too. Because how did you think to make that? God is okay with different, and he uses different. And there's a lot of different folks. And watch this, watch this. If you go back far enough in David's lineage, you'll see a lot of different folks. Remember the Moabitess? That's his great-grandma, right? You go back farther than that, Rahab in Jericho. That's also his great-great-great-great-great-great-grandma. Some different uncircumcised folks, right? Here's the reality. God doesn't care how different you are. He just wants what's available. He wants who's available. And even if, even if what, what Eliab says about David is true, that his heart is conceited and it's wicked and so on and so forth, guess what? God can use that as well. Because according to my Bible, Judas also healed people and casted out demons and was able to pass out fish and loaves. Amen? 
And Christ called him a devil from the beginning, but God was able to use him. God can use you. And what we learned last week, he was still using Saul. Even when Saul had decided to rebel, God still, he was patient with him and worked with him. God will use anyone who is available, no matter how dark your heart is, no matter how much you've rebelled, no matter how agnostic you are or atheist or whatever it is, God is like, yo, I can still work with you. David, you a little cray, but I can work with you. God likes different. God can use different. God can use you. Let's wrap up here. 1 Samuel 17, 38 says, then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones and from the stream, put them in his pouch and the shepherd's bag and, and his sling in his hand and approached the Philistine. Can I just say something to you, young folks? Fight in your own armor. Fight in your own armor. I know some of you are about to graduate and your parents are so excited because you're going to follow in their footsteps because that was their destiny for you. Sorry, parents, I know this will be the last time you're here at Vallejo Drive, but. But just because your mom and father are dentists does not mean that is your path. You want to be where God has called you to be. And if that is an artist or a poet or a musician or a graphic designer or you want to go to Switzerland and climb a bunch of Alps, whatever God has placed in your heart to do, you do. Parents, your responsibility is to not make them into your mold. Your responsibility is to help create an environment where they can be in the mold of Christ. That's your only responsibility. My son does not like my preaching. He doesn't even like church. And I'm okay with that. You know what he does like? He likes his friends. He likes the people at church. Well, that's you're on the right path, buddy. That's what I want. I'm not trying to make him a preacher. Why would I put that burden on him? I want him to be who he is. When my daughter came into our house, she she was 16 years old, and she told me right away, she's like, I, I don't believe in God. I said, Cool. I just don't want you trying to read a bunch of verses to me. I don't, and I won't. And I've seen my daughter vacillate back and forth in her faith journey. And I never put any pressure on her to act a certain way, think a certain way. It's not my job. My job is to be a safe place for her to land, for her to, for her to be inquisitive and to ask me questions. And there are times she'll vacillate. She'll say, Dad, I read your book. I'm, I'm there now. And I'm like, that's great. Two weeks later, Dad, I'm not there anymore. Okay. It's Okay. You're on your own journey. You don't have to wear my armor because I wasn't wearing anybody else's armor. I'm also different and weird. My, my professors did not recommend me to any conference. To any conference. And they were asking me, why didn't your professors recommend you? I don't know. I probably wouldn't recommend myself. And when they said, when they asked me, would you be willing to come to Vallejo Drive? You mean the church that's right across the street from the conference? Yep. Y'all crazy. I'm different, I know, but that's okay. The most important thing is to fight in your armor because that's when you'll have peace. That's when you're gonna have joy. That's when you're gonna have happiness. It doesn't matter if you're a surgeon and you're making you know, lots and lots of money if you're unhappy. Christ says, I tell you all these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is our last text, our last text for Samuel 17. 45 and 47, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied this day. The Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your, we're just going to just, yeah, we're going to nix that because there's kids here. This very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord, what, saves. For the battle is 
the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Now listen, at, at first glance, ostensibly David is overmatched, right? He's overmatched. He doesn't have the armor, he doesn't have the height, he doesn't have the reach, he's overmatched. But that's because we don't understand ancient warfare. See, in ancient warfare, there was the, 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 the cavalry that rode on horses and chariots, and then there was the heavy infantry, which was Goliath, armored soldiers that were in the battlefield that wanted close combat, and then there was the artillery. That's who David was. David was a sniper. Call of Duty, anybody? Battlefield? If you didn't get it, it wasn't for you. It's for the kids that play video games. David was a sniper. They called them slingers. That even sounds dope. Doesn't it sound like, yeah, yo, I'm a slinger. Actually, it sounds inappropriate in some way. Anyways, all right, so slingers, the really good ones, could hit someone from 200 yards away and maim them or even kill them. Six to seven revolutions in a second. So David put those, those rocks, in, and, and what, I've, what, I've, what I've learned in my research is that the rocks in that valley are more dense than any other rock in the area. So he got some rocks that, that, that some scholars say that, that have the impact of a 45 revolver. Like, it's like a gunshot. So when David came swinging his sling, it was like he had a rifle aiming it at Goliath. Now let me ask you this question here. Who's overmatched? Goliath came prepared for hand-to-hand combat. Where's my shield? Where's my shield? Where's my spear? All that kind of stuff. David, like, I ain't even getting that close to you, bro. I ain't, I, I ain't that dumb. The Bible says that David actually ran towards him. And as he's running towards him, Goliath's like, all right, tell him his arm. Okay, give, hey, give, me my, give me my shield. Give me my spear. As soon as he looks up, boom, shot right between the eyes. Goliath was overmatched. Just on weaponry alone. We always look at the story of David and Goliath as, look at this one miracle. Look at what God did. He took this little boy and guided the stone. God didn't have to guide that stone. David was skilled at what he, do, at what he did, and, and, and he knew it. He told Saul, this is what I've done. I've always done this. God has always delivered me. I am not afraid of this Philistine. He'll go down just like the bear, just like the lion, just like Baloo and Mufasa. He's going down. Family, this is what happens when we fight in our armor, when we're a little bit extra with the ordinary things. It leads us to places of great opportunity. We believe in ourselves when no one else will believe in us because we see where God is leading us and what God has placed in our heart. When we do this, they all fall down. Every giant, every obstacle, any problem, insecurity, depression, anxiety, God uses it all. He uses it all. He uses it all. And he's making something really extraordinary in you. And I can't wait battle. And I pray that our church and your family do everything they can to support you because you've been called to fight in your own armor. Change the world. Do what we could not do in world hunger, in racism. You do it in your armor. Show us how it's done. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for the call you've given us to have hearts like a champion, reminding us of all these little details, ordinary things that amount to great opportunities. May we be extra so that you can make us extraordinary. Father, if we don't have enough encouragement and trust from others, may our faith and trust in you give us all that we need to continue to go forward and fulfill the dreams. We're not trying to follow in our parents' footsteps. We want to follow in your footsteps, wherever they may lead. And may we find not more infighting in our family and our church, but may we find the equipment, the tools, the encouragement, the support that we need to 
finish the job. Because you are going with us. The battle is yours. Thank you.